Ani, Bojao. <clears throat> How are you? Is this working or what? Hold on just a second. I need to reload this live on my computer so that I can see your comments. And I'll remember to do live chat this time. For some reason, YouTube has this feature where they, uh, they have top chat and then live chat. And top chat doesn't show you everything. <laughs> Like every comment, I mean. So last live, I had it on top chat and I didn't realize. So hopefully I, I didn't miss anybody's comment. Because I would have felt bad. But yeah, so um, first I just want to show this guy. <laughs> this is my friendly little octopus. He is, uh, you know, usually they smile and then they get angry. This one is angry and then she gets angrier. So I just, I thought she would be a great companion, honestly. But there's that. Um, I want to turn on music again, even though YouTube kicked me in the butt last time. So I had to submit um, a review so that they could like a human could review it and determine that no, I did not violate any rules. And uh, they ended up determining that I didn't because this is royalty free. This isn't copyrighted music and I pay for the subscription. So yeah, I am just preparing. I've actually been beating all evening so far. I think I started um, around six o'clock or so, and, oh, let me turn it back on here, and I'm gonna be honest with y'all, I, oh my god, top vibes, <laughs> top, switchy top, anyway, I almost canceled on y'all, <laughs> because I am having a bad rib day, um, I actually, it started last night. Um, I've just been struggling with my, my rib. So if you are watching right now and you have not heard, and I'm sorry to those who have heard this over and over again, I broke my rib. <clears throat> it's not a severe break. It's just cracked. But I've actually been feeling kind of limber lately the past, I don't know how many days not really feeling any pain. I actually, I felt so good that I hadn't been even taking my ibuprofen, my, my Motrin's. But uh, I got home last night after feeling good all day and I could barely lift my arm up to, to you know, reach for things in the kitchen and cook myself dinner. And it's kind of remained that way. And we, of course, got piled on with snow. Not as bad as the time where I, I told you my neighbor helped me. <laughs> he, he rescued me at the snowblower and then laughed at me when I told him how I cracked my rib. Um, but it still snowed quite a bit. And I was trying to shovel this morning just a little bit. Shovel a walkway and then get myself out of the driveway. And I couldn't, leave, I couldn't lift up the shovel. So I'm enlisting the help of my parents tomorrow. I told them I'd cook them some dinner if they would come help me <sighs> shovel my driveway. But how, how did I crack my rib? <laughs> Is that um, what you're asking? I jumped into a snowbank. <laughs> I jumped into a snowbank and I am looking for the beadwork I just completed over the past hour and a half and I don't see it. If you could just give me a quick second, I will be right back. My cat Spicy was lingering over here. I'm kind of worried that she grabbed it and took it. So I'll be right back.
my god, I don't know where it is. What happened to it? I swear I I brought it over here. Yo, this is messed up. Did you knock it over? No. Spicy, I swear if you took that and ate it or hit it so that you can eat it later. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Yeah, talking to you, sis. Oh, I see it. I'm still blaming you, Spicy. Uh, I see more comments. I'll look at them in just a second. We're having a chaotic evening, true Gemini fashion. Oh my God, okay, I found it and I'm back. This is what I made. It's uh, not quite finished yet. Here's an example piece. This is my, uh, I don't know what to call this, lanyard, rope, key handle, um, but I'm basically gonna like copy its format here. I bought this at a powwow. I didn't make this, but, um, put some leather there. And then instead of a, putting it on a, a key ring, I'm going to put it on like a hook. So yeah, I'm going to use these same colors, but I think I'm just going to do a different design. Um, so yeah. Um, I just watched a video of a guy jumping into banks, like just how, well, here's the thing, since you don't know, I'm going to retell the story. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but basically, um, we had gotten a bunch of snow. Uh, this is like right before Christmas. We got a bunch of snow and my driveway needed to be shoveled. It was real fluffy, real fluffy snow. So I decided, um, after hearing a TikTok sound <laughs> that this sound would be really great. If you, hopefully you know what a TikTok sound is, you know how, when you hear a TikTok sound and you just know like what kind of content you could do with that sound. I just thought this sound would be great if I were to, um, just like rage and jump into a snowbank. So I decided I'm gonna make use of this tons of snow that we got and pile a bunch of snow from my driveway into a single snowbank and then jump into it for the TikTok, right? What I have failed to remember was that just the few days prior to that, uh, we had a big warm front if that's what you call it. Um, and so there was a lot of melted snow. And then before we got the, the fluffy snow, it cooled down again. So that warm front, basically it just froze over into ice. So when I had piled that fluffy snow into the snow bank, um, my body went right through it and just hit the ice that was underneath. And I hit it just the right way that I cracked my rib. And I didn't know that until a few days later. I took a big old stretch at my office desk and my rib just popped. I could hear it. I felt it. And I immediately started to feel lightheaded and woozy. And I nearly passed out right at my desk. So... Yeah, I'm now in the healing process and it was right before Christmas too. So I had a hard time um, on Christmas. It sucked in that sense. Anyway, my Christmas is good, but being in pain sucked is what I mean. And um, yeah. <clears throat> Let's see. Hey, Tanisha. You love the cat's name is spicy. Yes, she is so spicy. Actually, I got her from Canada because I, I was dating somebody in Canada for like a minute and their coworker had a bunch of kittens to give away. So I said I would take one 
and um, because they're in Canada. I live in a border town, by the way, because they were in Canada and there's a lot of restrictions on how you travel over there. It was really difficult for me to get over there <laughs> without just doing a bunch of stuff, you know, taking COVID tests, using their app, blah, blah, blah. It was hard. So because it was difficult, Every time I would pick a cat and like say, oh, I'll take that one. Um, she ended up finding somebody that wanted that cat. And I was like, no, give them, give them to the people. I will just, I'll just take whoever's left. I don't want any cat to lose out on their forever home, you know? And um, so time went on and it had been probably a month and there were only three cats left. And she had... She said that she was attached to one, which she did end up getting, getting rid of, by the way. Um, and so I said, you know, I'll, I'll take this tortie then. She said, well, the last two are spicy. They hiss at me. They don't let me pet them. They bat at me, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, I am the cat whisperer. I am great with cats. I will still take her. Um, spicy cats still deserve a home. So even if I have a cat that doesn't allow me to pet them and, and touch them or whatever, then fine, whatever. I'll just, I'll have an angry friend. <laughs> and so I finally get her and sure shit, she hisses at me. She won't let me touch her. She won't let me go anywhere near her. It took her a full two weeks before she allowed me to pet her. And even then, it, it was still, she was still kind of weary of it. And um, her name was supposed to be Soup. It was between Soup and Doja Cat. But a few of my friends were like, no, don't name her Doja. Because if Doja gets canceled, then you'll feel bad about your cat's name. So I was like, okay. <laughs> and um, so I landed on Soup. But the girl that had her, that I got her from, she kept calling her spicy. She's like, just so you know, this cat is spicy. And so when I was going through the initial, uh, like, raising, the initial stages of raising her, um, I kept calling her spicy myself. I'm like, wow, you really are spicy. So that is how I landed on the name Spicy. Yes, a wristlet keychain, except it's not quite, yeah, it's not going to be quite wide enough to go around the wrist. Mine actually isn't either, but it's still a great handle. Those are so lovely. I want one. What, one of these or one of these? <laughs> I'm kidding. I know what you mean. Um... I hope you're okay. So sorry that happened. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it sucks. And it's, it's kind of difficult to have this happen during the winter time when I have a broken snowblower and the only way to clear my driveway is to shovel it. <laughs> but it's fine, I guess. I know you're Canadian, Tanisha. I remember. So Spicy kind of named herself. She showed it. Oh my goodness. And she knows she's spicy. She is a tortie. A tortie cat. Um, and people who have torties are very familiar with this. But basically torties are notorious for having attitude. So much so that um, the term tortitude has been coined. <laughs> And that they have RBF, resting bitch face. And torties are actually mostly female. It's actually very rare for a torty cat to be born male. There are some male torties, but again, they're very rare. And if you don't know what a torty is, it's just a fur pattern that is, um, they're very similar to calico cats, but calico have white on them, and torties are just um, black, dark brown, and like caramel. 
How do you know when you are ready for a bead business and how do you loom? Uh, well, I can't answer the first one because I don't have a bead business. Um, I have taken a few commissions and I've beaded a few gifts and I've, um, I've just been commissioned to bead that, uh, Eagle staff, but that isn't a paid commission. That's more of just like a community duty, I guess. Um, so yeah, I don't know about the business thing, but I don't know if you want me teaching you how to loom. <laughs> No, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. It's not a bad question. So I don't even know what I'm going to do here. I know I don't want to repeat this, but I just kind of started going and telling story after story. Um, so I guess I'll just take a quick break on this. Um... I've done a Q&A before. It wasn't live. I recorded it and edited it. Back then, I was really surprised with how many questions I got. I got so many. Um, but this time, I didn't really get very many. I didn't get any on Instagram. I got one on Twitter, I do believe. Yes. I got one, and it was just my friend trolling me. She asked, do I own North Face? No, I do not. I don't have any North Face brand <laughs> stuff. Um, and then I got two on YouTube, but one of them, well, both of them actually have multiple comments. So <clears throat> what is a loom? Um, let's see. I have this one right here, but it's really torn apart. It has a project on there that my son started almost two years ago now, but I could not get him to continue working on it. And Spicy, the cat, decided it was a great toy. But basically a loom is um, a big platform that you put strings on. And then this is the kind of beadwork that you can do on it. So, yeah. Got a lot of fixing to do on that. Oh, I guess I'll just set it there. I can start the looming but get lost afterwards. That's funny because I can't really start looming. I can never figure out how to get the strings on there. Um, I know how to do it, but I don't know how to do it well. You're always trying to learn about other cultures. Me too. Sorry, I didn't see the call for questions. Also, Lumi. No, it's okay. Um, I think last time when I did the Q and A, people had like a week <laughs> to see it and submit questions. I under like the algorithm isn't great, you know. So, um, but today it was just like a few hours. Um, okay, so let's see. So I guess I'll answer, oh, um, kind of the slight one at the bottom. Somebody says, which is your favorite powwow? Um, I love this question because <laughs> I've talked about it a few times on my channel. My favorite powwow is the Sugar Island powwow. And that is um, put on by the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. Uh, it's just, it's a tiny little powwow. And it's a uh, traditional, it's not competition. And I don't know, I like the more intimate little powwows that are more traditional. Like there's no competition. Um, everybody knows each other, you know, and there's like little, uh, like specials of, or maybe you might understand them more as like games, like the potato dance or, um, 
why can't I think of what it's called? The two-step dance. Um, I just, I have so much fun at that powwow and I have logged it on this channel twice. So there's two vlogs of the Sugar Island powwow and if it happens again this year, I will for sure vlog it again. The thing about Sugar Island is it's, Sugar Island is a, a tiny little island off of Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan and you have to take a ferry to get on it and there isn't really much on there um and it's just kind of like in a field <laughs> and if you want to camp there you can because the field is so big uh sugar island is the best yeah it's so fun i just I had so much fun at this last, my favorite part of this last one was they had a two-step um, with just so many people in it. So two-step is like um, where you find a partner and most of the time it's like male and female as partners, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, but you find a partner and that basically forms two lines so you follow the leader of the two-step um and uh sorry i'm thinking at the same <laughs> I'm trying to concentrate on beadwork too you follow the leader and do their moves and um they might even separate into two different lines it's just so fun it's so fun I want to see if there's any vids on YouTube. Yeah, I have two of them. I, ha I haven't seen anybody else vlog Sugar Island. But, yeah, I have two of them. Those are the best kind of powwows. They are. I just... And don't get me wrong. I do enjoy going to big powwows, too. Um, the biggest one that I went to last summer... In 2021 was um, Baraga powwow uh, at KBIC Kiwanabe Indian Community, and that's quite a drive from where I am. It's like five five hours away from me, and we got lost on the way there <laughs> because my aunt is very bad at um, I don't know what she did. Very bad at putting maps in to her phone because nobody reads paper maps anymore <clears throat> the first sugar island vlog i put out though is kind of a bummer just because um i didn't dance that powwow because weeks prior to that i had sprained both of my ankles i know i'm always injured somehow i have a, a brittle body i guess <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um let's see they also asked do you have any content ideas for youtube that you'd like to share uh sure so right now i'm working on a cosplay um it's almost done i have most of the outfit completed but i still need to buy something to go with it and of course film me wearing the cosplay but I have a good uh probably like more than three quarters of the video edited and put together which is a lot because I have not done that much editing in a long time so look out for some cosplay. I do want to do more cosplay, which I understand is not um, typical of my content, but I just, the way I've tried to describe my channel to people is I, my channel is just me being an indigenous person and doing things that I like. And um, I like cosplay and I like, creating things so 
Um, I do also plan on doing a better ribbon shirt tutorial series. I just need to get on that. I had actually planned to do it really soon, but I got the hunger to do that cosplay. <laughs> the hunger. So the cosplay took priority over the ribbon shirt. I mean, because the initial, very bad, I might say, but still there, ribbon shirt tutorial. It's still there, but there's no cosplay on my channel and we need some cosplay so let's see biggest one I've been to is gathering of nations oh my god too many people I believe you I have ob ob I feel like most people have thought about going so of course I've thought about it too um I don't know if I would enjoy myself at that I am a dancer I like to dance at powwows. Um, I don't, I mean, I still enjoy being a spectator at powwows too, but when I'm going to a powwow, I want to dance. And if I go to Gathering of Nations, I'm gonna wanna dance, but I just feel like from what I've seen, I've never been there and I could be wrong, but from just videos and things that I've seen is um, you just get like, a few minutes of dancing, it seems like. I don't want to put on my regalia, do all that work, travel all the way there just to dance for a minute. So I don't know if I will ever go to... I feel like if I go to Gathering of Nations, it'll just kind of be like I'm there by chance. What I really want to do is go to, like, um, for big powwows. Uh, isn't there a good one in Denver? And I kind of, I want to try some southern powwows, too. But I'm a little scared of them. <laughs> Only because I'm a northerner. I'm, 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 all the Inuit are looking at me right now, like, okay. But I, I mean, like, I'm used to cold Michigan Upper Michigan, Upper Peninsula, Michigan, which is not the same as Lower Peninsula, Michigan. It's cold here, okay? 80 degrees is a hot summer day. Let's go to the beach. And um, that's probably like a break down there. And, you know, like Oklahoma or whatever. So I feel like if I, if I go to a powwow in the south, I'm going to have a hard time. <clears throat> Thanks for answering my question. Oh yes, those were you were the one who answered or who asked those. Excited to see that. Uh Gathering of Nations wins. Biggest one I've gone to was Pound Makers. I haven't heard of that one. It's so expensive there on the nose basically as far as the dancing. Yeah. I feel like and if you're gonna compete, you better be like really good it's like the olympics of powwow dancers i feel like that's not me Sorry, I know I'm being silent for a second, but I'm, I was really like fiddling with this. I have friends from here in Wisconsin that went at west to San Manuel. They said it's so hot and dry that you don't even sweat. Got to double hydrate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first time that I was in the desert, I went to Palm Springs, California. And here's the thing. I I went alone. I went by myself and I also packed very lightly. I went for five days and all I did was pack into a backpack. 
So because I was packing so lightly and I was only using a backpack, like I wasn't using a bigger container, like a luggage or whatever, um, I forfeited a few things like I'll use the shampoo and conditioner provided by the hotel and I'll also use the lotion provided by the hotel. Worst mistake ever. Worst mistake ever. Because I've, I've done that before. I've succeeded with that before. Um, but the thing is, my Michigan skin was not used to the desert, and it was so dry, and that hotel lotion was not doing anything, and I had no transportation to, like, go shop for better lotion. It was bad. <laughs> it was bad. <clears throat> Edmonton. Okay. Okay. Southwest is very different, windy as fuck. Beautiful powers, though. <laughs> Interesting. All right, let's see. Go down this person's list here. Um, the cultural significance of being folks should consider before taking on the craft without a mentor. Okay, so this is a really interesting question because um, beading isn't specifically an, an indigenous thing or a North American indigenous thing either. Beading is actually found all around the world. Um, in the, in the, the South, the North, um, and it's found in other cultures. So... I feel like when you think about beading, considering what style you're using, um, like you might end up kind of using a style from a whole culture and you just didn't even realize. I've also seen North American indigenous people not consider this as well they'll see um just like basic beadwork that doesn't really it's like some type of floral whatever and when I see it I I see it kind of like as European floral and I, I've seen them call them out like that they're uh appropriating and yeah it's <laughs> it's found in every culture and it isn't um it doesn't originate with us either. Like my people, Anishinaabe, before we had beads, because we got them from Europeans in the first place, before we had beads, it was things like porcupine quills. Um, and we would dye them. And those were like um, the main way that we adorned our garments besides beads. But styles of beadwork are definitely they can definitely be apparent um a few ways i can think of that is the ojibwe floral which is um i did that i think in the first first one or two lives you've seen it um on the eagle staff and I mean, you can Google it too, Ojibwe, Ojibwe florals. Um, those are a very specific beadwork design, um, which I don't think they're just Ojibwe either. Like there's, there's Potawatomi florals, and they are also Anishinaabe, and there's like Cree and Mati florals, which look very similar um, to Ojibwe florals. I don't even truly know uh, the way to di differentiate them like what the difference is it, just because they look so similar um but you can definitely tell an Anishinaabe floral from uh, a Dakota floral they look very different but it isn't just about flowers there's also like southwest looking designs there's west coast designs um but 
like I said, it isn't just North American indigenous people that have used beadwork as a means of expression. There's cultures all around the world that have done it too. Um, there's Af a lot of African cultures have used beadwork that I feel like North American natives kind of, um, I don't want to say like copy or like took inspiration from, but it just, it looks similar. So, um, I guess just taking that into account, um, <clears throat> and for the t without a mentor part, I feel like that's touchy because some people are just, they're reconnecting and maybe they don't have a mentor. I know that I've met a lot of Native people who grew up out of their community and don't have access to something like a mentor. I I guess I was um, blessed enough to have somebody mentor me and teach me. But when it comes to the mentor thing, that I guess would be, just speaking for my culture specifically anyway, that would be to learn the teachings that are involved with beadwork, but those teachings aren't necessarily exclusive to beadwork they are um kind of you can apply those same teachings to just creating in general oh let's see what can be considered indigenous with would be the patterns right yeah the patterns is is what i like the patterns and the designs um yeah iroquois florals and family patterns See, I know my Cree Matee fam from North Central Alberta does mostly flowers, and my Blackfoot fam from the Blood Tribe in Southern Alberta do a lot of geometric and sharp designs. Yeah. <laughs> You're fine, Tanisha. Um, there's this channel that I really like, and she's actually a great inspiration for my own videos as well. I just love how she does her videos and how she, um, how skilled she is. She's called The Closet Historian, and she does lengthy step-by-step -step videos on sewing mostly historical garments um she does a lot of mid-century like mid-20th century stuff which is kind of how i found her because you know you know your girl likes the, the 1940s fashion she does a lot of those but she also dabbles in other decades as well um but she just made oh god i think it was a Victorian, like a late Victorian era costume. And she did beadwork on it. <laughs> she did spider webs on it. And then I think there was another dress that she did where she beaded bugs, like, like beetles and stuff. Um, she beaded brooches with that. Oh, you know the closet historians go to? She's so great. And just calming. She has a very calming voice. Oh, shoot. I think I ended up with a gap here. But yeah, she that I just brought that up because she's kind of an example of um, a non-indigenous person doing beadwork. I mean, you see beadwork on um, bridal gowns a lot of the time too.
Hmm. Let's see. Oh, spicy. Well, I'm not drinking my water with that straw now. I feel like it, I think it touched her butt. How have you seen beads unite nations? Shameless shrip, shipreppeads.com plug. <laughs> so Cassie says go to shipreckbeads.com to purchase beads. I personally shop from powwowsupply.com. Um, how have I seen it? beads unite nations? I guess just through support um historically trade trade and um the sharing of designs but currently i just i see a lot of from what i observe online is it's definitely a big way to support one another um I constantly see online people sharing their beadwork for sale or just to just to share their art and um, people will support that through um, praise and appreciation or they'll m support them monetarily by purchasing their art as well um, but also the beaded eyebrow definitely <laughs> united some nations. <laughs> Everybody was loving that back in um, 2020, which the two year anniversary of that beaded eyebrow is actually coming up to. Uh, that video was out on the third and I believe it was either later that day or the day after that I shared the uh, pictures of it on Twitter um, and then it blew up so yes I used to do historical recreate recreation so I found her that way oh I just I want to but it's just finding the time to do stuff like I the cosplay that I just worked on I was just so excited for it and that's why um it ended up taking priority, but I have so many projects under here, under my belt, that I'm like, oh, I want to do historical recreations, but the time, the money, where am I going to get it? Um, what I, I mean, I, got, I have done a few 40s recre recreations, and I do want to do more. Um, I have some leftover fabric from this cosplay, and I think I kind of want to do a skirt jacket with it but we'll see. Uh, but going back further, I would like to do a Regency gown. <laughs> and uh, anybody I've told this to, they're like, why? I'm like, well, for one, Regency gowns are just so pretty. But I'm also a big uh, Pride and Prejudice fan um, from Jane Austen. And uh, I mean, I prefer, just to put this out there, I prefer the 1995 version <laughs> of the show. Um, and that's during the Regency era of um, England. And they have beautiful dresses. I would also like to make a historically accurate corset. I haven't decided from what era though. So, yeah. Um, how's it going? I'm making a lanyard. Very nice. Thank you, Terrence. This is one that I made uh, in about an hour and a half before the live. And now I'm making a second one. Uh, these are going to be gifts. I'm not keeping these or selling them. Go to Bead and Pow Wow Supply. I, I mentioned them. Her, I mentioned it. <laughs> In fact, that's where these beads came from. <laughs> these beads, this needle. Although my, my thread didn't 
it came from uh, the one that's in Sioux, Canada. Trailblazing. Yeah. I was thinking of making my very own design just for me to be my own items in my wardrobe. I think that could be pretty cute. Also, the beaded brow is iconic. <laughs> um, our tribal chair person actually uh, one year made a ribbon skirt where um, they had feather applique on it and she beaded the, the quill onto the applique. And that was to be like auctioned off at the powwow, but I thought that was really cool. It's like beadwork on a ribbon skirt. I like it. <clears throat> it was fun but costly. I prefer dancing powwow. Regency is cool. Um, I'll have to look that up. R O C C O C O. I don't want to say it wrong. What nation is that? Is that, um, Regency is like England? Is, is that also England or is that a different nation? Though, I don't want to say it wrong. Where do you get your cording and how thick is that cording? Um, I don't remember where I bought this from. I think I just bought it from like Walmart. Yeah, I, it's utility cord. Um, oh, I got it at Meyer. If you don't know what Meyer is, it's just, it's like a Walmart or a Target. I don't know. Does 550 PSI mean something? England, France, I think 1700s. Oh, okay. And like the thing about those eras, Regency included, is you also have to think about the undergarments because a lot of the time the undergarments um, really shape what the trend is. Or I didn't say that correctly. A lot of the time the trend of like what their what their clothing looked like what fashion was it wasn't just the outermost layer it was also the undergarments that provided the structure um so like in regency a good stay that like pushed your boobs up wasn't totally essential <laughs> but um definitely a big a big player in um, the shape, but I, I think like a good example of this would be throughout the Victorian era, which there were there were several different fashions in the Victorian era because she was such a long reign, right? But the the corset shapes were very important. You couldn't just put on a Victorian dress and call that Victorian. You really need the undergarment. You need the corset. Rakoko? Okay, thank you. I'm like, I really don't want to say it wrong. <laughs> Still working on my new leggings and mocks, but I'm having a bit of a block with designs. I feel that. Yeah, I go through that too. Um... I am a craft worker of many mediums, however. I don't know if you guys just heard my cat hit a bag and run by, but that noise was her, if you're wondering. Um, but yeah, I'm a craft worker of many mediums, so a lot of the time when I'm feeling a block, I end up either consciously deciding, okay, I'm going to shift over and do this other thing now, or it just kind of happens that way. So for instance, um, I took a break from beating the Eagle Staff for a little bit and I made a crocheted shirt. Okay, let's see. This person asks, what's been problematic in the beating social media community? 
problematic. Uh, stealing, I feel like. I experienced that a few times myself. Um, this girl tried to take credit for the, the beaded makeup thing because she she chose to do eyeshadow <laughs> um and at one minute she was like oh you inspired me and then the next minute she was like no i came up with this on my own and i don't know at first i wasn't upset about it because i'm like it's really not that serious but um i'm not gonna go into all the details but uh, let's just say the way that she carried herself through that, the, the things that she did behind the scenes, it was very evident that she was malicious about it. Um, but I also <laughs> beaded a butt plug as a joke, as a, it was a gag, total gag, um, I don't even have it anymore. But everybody on my feed on Twitter for a good year by that point had been asking, when is somebody going to beat a butt plug? They, they just, everybody wanted a, a beaded butt plug for some reason. So one day I seen it come up on the timeline again. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do this. So I, I beaded a butt plug and... um. I had been notified a few times of people taking my pictures and posting them to like Facebook or whatever, um, stealing my images and saying that it was their work and that they were selling, which worries me. Like it, it didn't anger me as much as it was just kind of annoying, like, don't steal my work like that. Like, I should have watermarked it. But I just... I guess I just didn't realize that I should have done that. Um, but it also worries me because that was not sanitary. There was no sanitary way to do that. I had several people in my DMs at that time that I did the beaded butt plug. I mean several people in my DMs asking to purchase and I said, "Listen, this was just a gag. It was a joke. Um I could not in good conscience sell you this <laughs> because it would be so unsanitary. You'd get you'd probably get one use out of it and then it, I just you would have to sort of, for lack of better words, waterproof the beadwork. And that wasn't it. So, yeah, a problematic thing is all the theft that happens. It's really, it's really sad. Um, I bought so many more beads all in bulk. <laughs> Hey, <clears throat> let's see. Stealing ideas and not giving credit. Yeah, yeah. You can just cover the beadwork in resin, right? That's something that actually came up at that time. Um, I was actually having conversations with people who were resin workers who said that they were going to come up with <laughs> some some ways and so some people who had dm'd me asking to purchase a beaded butt plug i actually told them like i can't sell you this but i do know that it's in the works by somebody else who is a resin worker but um i don't know what happened but it it didn't happen fell through <laughs> well I'm I'm glad that you can't stop laughing because that was the point of the beaded butt plug <laughs> it was to laugh 
Instead, I had plenty of people who were dead serious about having one. <laughs> I've also had so many other requests for a beaded um, toys and stuff like that. Um, there's actually somebody on Twitter. Um, I love their work. They beaded a crop. They beaded a crop and um, they also beaded a bong. <laughs> um, yeah, their, their Twitter is anti carpet weed. And they're just, they're really cool. I really like, um, I mean, I don't know them. So what do I say? Like, I like their tweets. Like, I don't know. I enjoy seeing them on my timeline. I don't believe they kept the crop or the bong, though. I think they um, sold them, which is good. Happy for them. <clears throat> Let's see. The I, I, Is that supposed to be biggest? The biggest issue in the beadwork community is others trying to steal originality and pass it off as indigenous. Like when non-natives make mocks and mucklucks and try to pass it off as indigenous. Oh, yes. That is the highest form of appropriation. Um, I mean, just like a regular everyday person can appropriate some indigenous culture, you know? But when they repackage it and sell it, when they monetarily gain from it while actual indigenous people are struggling, that is, to me, the highest form of appropriation. To me, that's like a um, big slap in the face. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Opinions on folk who learn beading online exclusively. I don't find a problem with that. Um, I would hope that they would find, if they cannot physically find community, at least finding community. I mean, if they learn online, they can probably find community online and learn from others to... I'm just, I'm saying this because it is, in my opinion, totally okay to learn how to bead online. I mean, I do tutorials. I have had several people profusely thank me because they had no other option for um, whatever they, they used a tutorial for. Um, <clears throat> so it'd be quite quick hypocritical of me to say you should only learn in person but I would like to think that if you are doing these things that you are also going to attach some spirituality from your culture to them and I cannot provide that for you for a number of things for a number of reasons I mean number one you may not be from my tribe and our teachings may be completely different and for another, I have been um, not personally, individually, like in terms of my channel, but I have in general been taught by the elders of my community not to um, give teachings out like that. So, <clears throat> I needed a drink of water. So, learn how to beat online exclusively that's fine I would just hope that um if you're going to attach spirituality to it that you seek out uh community for that and again you can seek out community online as well you can find um you know if you're Anishinaabe you can find Anishinaabe people online and talk with them privately 
you can't just like hop into somebody's dms though and be like hey will you teach me this because they're probably going to be like um no um that's why i say fine community like that's why i chose that language specifically why does my music keep turning off Oh, it's at the end. Well, we'll just start it over. Okay. I can't stand that when people dress up as natives for Halloween. Yeah, it's... That's a whole thing. Don't even get me into that. <laughs> um, like... Here in Winnipeg, be the tops for mops and mufflucks and sell them for dirt cheap and take away the meaning of those designs. In Alberta and in my city, I get annoyed because there's a casino on a res and the city keeps trying to build on the land and it frustrates me. It should not be anything if it is just beating. I had nobody teach me as a kid. Before internet, I got books and then um, my one grandma shared her patterns too, but she did not teach me. Yeah, yeah, like it's, it's, it's just beads it's just bead work um that's why I say like if you if you're going to put spirituality into it I sure hope that you are learning that spirituality appropriately that what I said before was a very long-winded way of of that very final point that I just made if you're going to put spirituality into your bead work I hope that you are learning it appropriately Yeah, it is sad. And it, it is illegal in America, but unfortunately, they still get away with it. Um, what is that? What's that brand? Mini Tonka. That's in America. Mini Tonka Moccasins is out of, like, Minnesota or something. And they're not native. And a lot of people get away with it too on places like Etsy or whatever and, and like online marketplaces because they call it uh, quote unquote like Native American style or Native American uh, inspired. As a black woman, I'm always trying to learn more about the indigenous peoples. I live in a province with a big population of indigenous peoples, and I will continue to advocate and learn. Um, in my, what I think about that too is that you yourself are an, an indigenous person as well. Um, you've just, I mean, I don't know your family's history, I don't know if you've been displaced or um, if your family immigrated by choice. But I think that one thing that a large <laughs> portion of the population forgets is that um, black people are indigenous people. Mini Tonka doing things to amend for their past behavior now, I think. Well, I freaking hope so. They should turn the company over. <laughs> okay, let's see. This is their last one. Uh, beaters from other nations and culture you look up to and that we need to know about. Um, oh god. I am so bad at just, so you know how on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, there will be those like online challenges where they're, they're like, um, do this thing and then tag seven other people to do it with you. I will usually do the thing that I've been tagged to do but I never tag other people. 
Because how could I choose who to tag? And that's just kind of, um, that's what my brain does. I guess in the history of my channel, one of my earlier videos was me beating a pair of heels. <laughs> I still have them. They're still like on display in my bedroom. And that was inspired by Jamie Okuma, who is a Shoshone Bannock uh, artist. If you haven't looked her up, I highly suggest. She, I don't know if she does it anymore or if she has done it in a while, but she has beaded, um, like fully beaded uh, luxury brand shoes, like Louboutins and like, um, what else has she done? Givenchy, I think. So she was the inspiration for my beaded heels. See you later, Skoden. <clears throat> oh my gosh, my voice is going out. So we've been live for about an hour. Um, I'll stay just a little bit longer and then I'm going to head out. So that is all the questions that I had from people. Um, this is also my very first time doing wrap stitch. I don't know if that's an interesting fact or not. I never did wrap stitch before this. Well, before this. <laughs> I've made, um, plenty of ropes but they were all peyote. I, I love a good peyote stitch. But I don't have time to do peyote, so I know wrap st stitch is quicker, and, you know, I gotta try it once, at least. So, here we are, making milestones. And I enjoy it. I know that um, some people tack down their beads more, than what I'm doing, but I feel like this is good enough. Do the status cards in the States look similar to the cards in Canada? I don't know. I don't know what they look like in Canada. Um, are the status cards in Canada the same for each tribe? Because they're not here. It depends on your tribe for what your card looks like mine is just it has my picture on it my tribal number uh my name my address the date it was issued and on the back is our chairperson's signature at the time that it was issued but I know like some cards will say like certificate of Indian status where mine just says like Bay Mills Indian Community Tribal Member. And like some cards will say, um, some tribes will have their blood quantum listed on the cards. Mine doesn't. Is it harder to get enrolled in the States? Again, I, don't, I can't make a comparison because I don't know the process. In Canada, and the process is different for each tribe as well. Um, a lot of tribes in the Western United States have a blood quantum um, minimum. Um, so, like, for instance, I had this friend who was not enrolled in her tribe. She couldn't enroll because the blood quantum minimum was five-eighths. Which is a little over half if you don't, um, if you don't know that fraction. But, um, 
yeah, she didn't meet the minimum, so she couldn't enroll. Uh, my tribe, you have to prove descendancy to somebody that was on um, one of the rolls. <clears throat> Which again, if you don't know what a roll is, it's a census. There were several roles taken. There were several censuses taken um, at the turn of the century from the 19th to 20th century. Um, and yeah, if you could prove your descendancy to a Bay Mills person on that role, then you could apply for enrollment. And I imagine that's that might be the same for other tribes too that do it based off of descendancy. Um, I do know that it gets a little stickier in the south for tribes that do descendancy and not blood quantum um, because they have such a deep history with um, enslaved communities, black communities, and freedmen. It's a whole thing that I don't even I'm not even fully educated on myself. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of them don't have the enrollment that they have the right to. All the new cards look the exact same and now they can be scanned for tax exemption. Mine only has a strip on it to get a gas discount at the res gas station. <laughs> yeah, it's hella different across the ditch, isn't it? My band card says treaty fishing and hunting me membership identification. That's pretty dope. <laughs> Uh, we go by Descendancy here, but my partner's band goes by Blood Quantum. As far as I know here in Canada, it's through your mother or father or a relative has to claim you. That really sucks for people who are just so far removed. And I just, I was born on the res, raised on the res. My entire family was on the res. I am so, I'm very connected to my community. So I have no experience with reconnecting or um, having to go through enrollment process or whatever. I was just born a member, right? But I have met and come into contact and developed relationships with people who um, have connection to my community, but, or I should rephrase that, people who are disconnected from my community, but um, are like members of my tribe. Yeah, I had one friend who, um, their mother is from my tribe and she had moved to downstate Michigan and um, her mother was also just not not into the culture our culture at all so she she taught her daughter like pretty much nothing about being a native person about being an Ojibwe person um, and she decided to, when she was a young adult, she decided to just come and move up here. Just move to the res, get a job here, and get to know her community. Um, but she ended up getting pregnant and having to move back. <laughs> she needed her mother's help. Um, but I also, um, I had a friend in high school... Uh, well, she was my friend longer than that. She was like my childhood friend and we were friends all the way up until the end of high school. And then she dropped out and just, she had a hard time. 
and uh, she had four children and again um, she was going through something I don't know what and she ended up losing her children and um, I guess I mean I call her my friend but she's also a cousin I'm related to her as well that's just how it is on the res you know and uh, I think about those kids every now and then because they were adopted out to a white family so that's gotta I mean the oldest he's in he's a teenager now and I just I imagine that eventually they're going to want um, to know where they came from and they're going to want to know their community and maybe maybe they'll even show up someday. Uh, my birth father is aware of his indigenous ancestry but cannot get his card due to no documentation and no one of his father's side to claim him. Uh, my family is born in Canada. My mom came from Jamaica but I don't know much else because my social worker sucked at helping me learn about my culture. I had to learn on my own. I was raised by white parents. My dad's side is Dutch and my mom's side is French. Oh, see, I was just talking about uh, my little cousins who were adopted to a white family. And I just, I imagine they're going to want to become, they're going to want to know more about their identity. And if they're anywhere um, near other Native people, then they're probably going to be really curious about, you know, cultural things too. So yeah, I'm I'm not one of those res people that are like, oh, reconnecting people are so annoying or they didn't even grow up here. I mean, sometimes, <laughs> let's just say sometimes somebody might do something that I'm like, come on. But um, like there's this one girl, <laughs> she, um, what is from here but she referred to the colors of the medicine wheel as the colors on our flag. And I, I was just like, come on. Uh, my biggest personal conflict is being a white passing indigenous two-spirit young man. Oh yeah, that's a mouthful there. Oof, big topic. And I'm, quite honestly, I've just, I've been on native Twitter for so long that I, I don't even engage in that topic anymore. Teaching kids about their culture is so important. It mess, it's messed me up big time and I feel like I don't have a true identity sometimes. I know I'm not an alien, so that's a start. Well, good. The alien part, I mean. I still absolutely love your fancy. Oh, thank you. I think I'm going to add a little more to it, actually. It's supposed to look like a bird. 
I thought I was making it look like a raven, but it kind of looks more like a vulture. So I'm a vulture, I guess. But um, it has, uh, I was trying to emulate like traditional like woodland art, the, the art form that is um, decorating animals, which is a lot of like lines and circles and stuff like that on the inside of the animal. So I have uh, like a blue, a few blue lines that are a ribbon that is that are um, in the bird. And I was thinking about turning those lines like um, doing some Ojibwe floral applique around those lines. Just to spice up my regalia a little more. So maybe I'll do that like in the spring. I don't know which one I like more. I like them both. As a Mi'kmaq, <clears throat> excuse me, as a Mi'kmaq Eastern woodland guy, I'm trying to incorporate more woodland beadwork into my regalia. And woodland can be taken two different or understood in two different ways too. It could be um, understood as those woodland florals, otherwise known as Ojibwe florals or Mati florals or Cree florals or Potawatomi florals, whatever kind of florals, right? Woodland florals. Or it could be like that art style um, of like drawing humans and animals. I don't know how else to describe it. Somebody who does uh, woodland art, um, I absolutely adore their art. And I mean, you see it everywhere and I do the art myself every now and then too. But they really consistently paint it and um, it's their livelihood as well. Is Mishiken Kwe on Twitter. Um, M-I-I-S-H E H N K W E Michigan Quay. Beautiful artwork. They're so good at it. I feel like I have to really try to do half as well as they do. Mi'kmaq beadwork is very circular and full of shapes. We use a lot of world, whales and sea creatures. Right, because Mi'kmaq is like eastern, eastern coast of Canada, right? So you see ocean animals. I can't believe how fast it is to do wrap stitch. Holy moly. 
I did not think I was I thought like oh there's no way I'm gonna finish these in time would have taken me several days to do this much in peyote stitch Oh yes, I think I've seen some of the Meek Mac birch bark baskets. This is so satisfying to watch. Well, thank you. That's why I keep doing it. I just kind of like, um, a long time ago, needed content for my channel and didn't really know what else to do next besides filming myself beating. And I was so surprised by how many people were like, I love this. This really helps me. I like to beat along with you. I like to just sit and listen. I like to just watch, whatever. And I was like, huh. Okay. Well, if you like it, I will keep doing it. Which I guess I could understand because, um, <laughs> so lately, um, I really like to scroll on TikTok and TikTok really promotes their lives now. And I was into painting my nails for a little while. And then about a year ago, I kind of just lost interest in it again. As you can see, I don't do anything with my nails anymore. In fact, they're kind of long. I need to clip them. But, um, that doesn't stop me from sitting and watching lives of nail techs putting on acrylics, putting, acryl putting acrylics on their clients. I also sat and watched um, this wig maker ventilate a wig, which ventilating is just a term for like crocheting individual hairs onto lace. And yeah, I don't do nails, I don't ventilate wigs, but I still watch them because it was so satisfying. I learned peyote stitch first, then finally needed to make a quick rope for a commission and learn wrap stitch. That's what I'm doing right now! I mean, it's not commission, but it's like, I usually do peyote, but I needed to get these done quick, so... <laughs> I still love peyote stitch, but it's nice to bust out a couple ropes in a day. I feel ya. This is pretty nice. Our um, previous travel chairman, which he's only gone now because he resigned so he could go work um, under Secretary Holland. Uh, Brian Newland is his name. He has a pretty high position up there, actually. <clears throat> but right when he was, like, starting to work in D.C. after he had resigned as our chairman, he's also my cousin, I should say, um, he commissioned me to do a, a beaded lanyard for him. He's like, I need something good for D.C. I'm going to be around all these natives. <laughs> He's like, they all got really nice lanyards and beadwork and stuff. And he's like, I just have like the most basic stuff ever. So he commissioned me and I did a fully peyote lanyard for him. Um, the picture is on my Instagram, actually. 
it's like white in different shades of blue but I was so nervous to do that because I have not taken very many commissions in my day um so I feel like a big reason that I don't really take commissions is because I get so nerve-wracked that they're not going to like it or that I'm going to mess it up or it's not going to be good quality or whatever. And so I was so nervous about that commission <laughs> and I worked so hard on it and I was like, I got to give him drip. I got to give him good drip. He's in DC working with all these freaking DC natives from all over the country. I would love to do a virtual Be With Me live video with you. I know. Uh, I just, the stream yard is expensive. It would be pretty fun to like get a group together though. Do like an Instagram thing. As for right now, I'm just trying to kick out content on the tube. I would have stabbed myself with that needle 50 times. Yeah, yeah. Believe me. It's been more than 50 times in my day. I haven't stabbed myself yet today though, but oh yeah. Um, ooh, this song is on the next video. <laughs> anyway, uh, one time I accidentally sewed my thumb. It like went up the side skin and I, it's really um, not rough there, but they're just, there isn't a lot of nerves and sensitivity right there. So I didn't feel it. And then I went to pull and the string like popped through my skin, but it wasn't so deep that it like bled or anything. Nice, good thoughts for your relative as they help Deb Holland. Thanks. I'm nearing the end of this. So it looks like I should do one more. Oh, I should have thought about doing, doing it. You know what I mean? Like having blue on the bottom on this side too I didn't think of that it's okay it'll be fine but I think we're gonna do one more blue and orange and then finish off with red but I should tie off this string because it's I absolutely love making wrap lanyards I make them to match for my medallions yeah usually I do peyote but um jeez there's this one girl that I seen at a uh, Mount Pleasant powwow a few years back. Um, she had like, it was one piece, like uh, the whole thing was together as one piece, I mean, but it was like four wrapped lanyards that were all um, connected together, you know, into, into one big multi-layered necklace. And it looked really nice. I've, I mean, I've seen people wear multiple um, wrap necklaces before, but there was just something about hers. I understand completely. I had to stop taking custom orders because it was super stressful. Yeah. Um, our current tribal chairperson. So, so what happened is we had the tribal chairperson and then when he got selected to work under Deb Holland, um, he resigned and then we had a special election for that and um, yeah we all elected our current one so it's not like it's not like the old 
chairman, like, people didn't like him anymore or whatever, and that's why he's out. Um, he just left to do something else. But our current tribal chairperson, her name is Whitney. Um, she's actually younger than me. She's a very young chairperson, but very good at what she does. Very intelligent. Her mom commissioned uh, moccasins for me. Where is my lighter? Her mom commissioned uh, moccasins from me, and I was so nervous. They were to be done for Christmas, and um, she has very big feet. Ugh. So I couldn't uh, use my own feet as like an example, and um, I'm just, I'm not great at making moccasins to begin with. <laughs> And I'm very honest about that. And I told her mom that too. I said, she's like, can you make moccasins? And I said, I can make them, but I'm not good at making them. And she's like, oh, good. I, I need a pair from you. And um, where am I with this? Okay. And so I was not only worried about making a quality pair of moccasins and having them turn out well because I just, I suck at moccasins. I messed up my mom's that I made her the year prior. But she's also the tribal chairperson. And I felt like these moccasins, they were, she didn't have a pair of moccasins. And that was the main reason her mom wanted to get her a pair was because she didn't have any. So, I knew that these moccasins, they're her only pair, they're definitely going to get worn. And because she's the tribal chairperson, she might wear them to somewhere important. <laughs> so, I was so nervous that I was going to mess them up. I had a... That's the thing about making um, stuff for people who are in environments of so much pressure, I guess is a good way to say it, is uh, being the one to craft their things for them. I feel like that's pressure for me. <laughs> Next time, make a mark in the middle before you start and it should match up closer. Yeah, I did not think of that at all. <laughs> I don't even think I would have thought of it if I wasn't on live talking. So I can't even blame the live for like being a distraction or anything. Which, you seen this mess up? This is why I get nervous about commissions. Because <laughs> I would mess that up. <clears throat> Whitney is a baddie. Yes, she is. Madison, but I'm calling her Maddie. Um, the person in the chat that says Whitney is a baddie, they're also responsible for the moccasins actually working out and fitting properly, just so everybody knows. Because they went and measured her foot and tr traced it onto paper. Which, I don't know if I shared the pictures of those moccasins online or not. I obviously couldn't share them immediately because they were a Christmas gift. So I figured I would wait until after she got them before I would post my work online. But, um, I think I forgot. I'm so close to finishing this rope. I am working with red luster beads 
orange luster beads and then blue opaque beads. And these are all size 11. It was between working on these and continuing to work on my other beadwork that I have going on, my, my several projects that I have. Let me go, I'm gonna find it real quick. Here it is, this is the progress that I have so far. But again, it's only one of them. And it's kind of big too. I wish I would have made it smaller. Now I have to roll this all over again because I decided to show off. Thank you. Million Project Lady. That's what they call me. I'm kidding, nobody calls me that except for myself. I actually used to be the kind of person that would only work on one project at a time. But, um, because at the time I felt like I got more done that way. But I think I was wrong. I feel like I'm getting more done now by working on more than one thing at a time. As long as I don't get too many projects going. I'm getting hungry too, y'all. I didn't eat dinner. You know what I gotta do is really get on making some earrings. I feel like I'm kind of in an earring rut for one. <laughs> Cause each morning I I look at my earring collection and I, it's kind of like when you look in the closet at all your clothes and you're, you're like, I have nothing to wear. That's kind of how I'm feeling about my earrings right now. I'm like, huh, do I wear these again? Uh, so that's one reason that I need to make some earrings. But also, I have so many, like, cabs, um, which are the those things that sit in the center, um, and just other little things for earrings. I have a bunch of fingernail posts that I haven't used yet. I finished one side of a blue pair of brick stitch diamonds with a little star charm just now since the beginning of the live. Oh, are you going to put them on the gram? Yeah, a while ago, I seen these like feather 
things that uh, you, you can like dangle from earrings. And I immediately bought them. They're so cute. Haven't used them yet. gotta put it on the gram where it didn't happen there are actually several things that i've made that haven't made on made it on the gram <laughs> um in 2020 my uncle had commissioned a pair of medallions from me and i didn't post them on the gram and to be honest that was mostly just because i felt like um it would have sparked discourse and that's why that's why i didn't post them um but they turned out really nice they weren't anything bad it's just um i have a lot of very political people that follow me and i, and I just i didn't want them to comment on these because they his son is in the marines and his wife is very, very proud of that. And so he had a pair of Marine Corps uh, cabs, center cabs, and he asked me to make them into medallions. So I did. <clears throat> I personally, like my personal opinions is um, I'm not a, big fan of the military or the US government or anything like that but um my uncle wanted some beadwork so I hooked it up good evening Marcy Lee I'm almost done just so you know because I've been on since 8 30 I'm only supposed to go on live for an hour or well, supposed to like it's somebody else's rule. It's just my own personal rule. <laughs> like a one hour is good. And here I am going on two hours. But when you're making progress something. <laughs> I understand. I've had a couple commissions I haven't fully posted. Yeah. It's not like I'm ashamed of them. I just don't want people's. I, I felt like somebody was going to share their opinion on it. And just turn it into something and I'm like eh, it's better to just keep it to myself keep it in the family and she loves her medallion too one was for her and then the other was for um my cousin's wife I don't bead but just came by to be nosy <laughs> that's good I don't mind. You don't got a bead. I am making, um, let me show you what it's going to be. These are my keys. It's just a little rope, little handle to go on a key ring or a lanyard or whatever you choose to. My next step after this is to, um, Put the leather on and um, loop that leather around. I'm not going to do a key ring. I'm going to do a hook.
This is very weird music. <laughs> oh wow, I need one. I just have a baby Yoda on my keys. <laughs> Kids put it on so I won't lose them. Um, the one that I have on mine, the orange one I just showed you, I did not make that. I actually bought it at, um, my Reza's powwow this past year. It was 15 bucks. Pretty good price, I think. Um, but I had actually wanted one for several years. But you know that thing that crafters do where we're like, we see something like that and we're like, uh... I don't think I'm going to buy it because I can make it for myself. I'll just make one. And uh, several years later, I still hadn't made myself one. So, yeah, I bought one. But here we are. This was today's creation. I'm going to finish these up tomorrow. It is 10.20 my time. And I got to work in the morning. So... I had fun. Uh, I don't know when next time I'll be live, but I'm thinking next week. I still don't have my kids next week, but I will have them the two weeks afterwards. So you probably won't see me after next week, but um, we'll see. I feel good right now. My rib isn't hurting. That's a good sign. I also took an 800 Motrin right before the live though. So maybe that's working but super angry octopus guy says bama p i say bama p thank you chico see you later tonisha bye momo Mo marcy nigan way we then if you're still there and anybody else um that's okay marcy <laughs> But I will see you guys later. Uh, Bama P. Guabman.